next week. Um, starting tomorrow night um, is the first week that we will be uh, participating on a monthly basis in the Fourth Friday Art Walk. So the last, uh, the fourth Friday, obviously, of every month, we will be participating along with, I think it's 17 other galleries in Prescott and, ha and be open into the evening. And uh, so we'd love to have you drop by. We'll have refreshments and so on. Um, and next week, we have a program uh, given by Steve Munsell, longtime Prescott College faculty member on polar ice, which is, he's been involved in field research on for many years. And the week after that, two weeks from tonight, Jeff Lovich, who's a, a biologist with the US Geological Survey and a turtle expert, will be talking about turtles of the world and conservation issues thereof. Uh, also, two other uh, kind of bigger, longer term things. Just today, you guys are the first people to hear this. We just today finalized the details on our January 2020 uh, expedition touchstone tour to Ecuador. Um, if you're interested in that, there's flyers out on the table and uh, we're going to be posting it online and so on uh, tomorrow. So we're real excited about that. And also some of you have expressed interest in being updated on our uh, national conference we'll be uh, convening and hosting in the fall near Sedona called, uh, called Reciprocal Healing, uh, Nature, Health, and Wild Vitality. And we'll be getting all the registration materials out for that. Uh, within about a week. So a lot going on and um, we'd love to talk to you about any of those things. So uh, without further ado, it's my great uh, pleasure tonight to introduce a, a longtime um, colleague uh, in the world of conservation biology, Dr. Andrew Smith, who is an emeritus faculty member at Arizona State University in Tempe. Um, I did some calculations the other night and was shocked to realize that it was over 25 years ago that Andrew and I first met uh, actually at a Society for Conservation Biology meeting and our paths have crisscrossed over the years and it's been really great uh, to reconvene and really happy to have him here. What I didn't actually realize I, when I first when we first met is what a dedicated naturalist Andrew is and natural historian so that's really wonderful but besides that he's a um, internationally known um, biologist, uh, uh, mammologist. Um, he's going to be talking about pikas tonight, um, but he's also, uh, well he's done a lot of res field research both in mountains of Western North America, but also in Asia, especially on the Tibetan Plateau. He was the lead author of the first ever field guide to the mammals of China, uh, among many other exciting things. He's the uh, chair of the uh, lagomorph, i.e. rabbits, pikas, etc. Uh, specialist group of the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the recipient of many awards, including the um, Aldo Leopold Conservation Award of the American Society of Mammologists. So, uh, and just a wonderful guy and a great naturalist, so please uh, join me in welcoming Andrew Smith. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for the very kind um, acknowledgements at the beginning. I'm going to talk today about a couple of species of pikas, as you have learned. Um, and what our, my goal is today is to compare and contrast two pikas that live in very different habitats, the American pika and the plateau pika in, in the Tibetan plateau. And then for each of them, I'm going to talk about some really salient um, conservation issues that um, uh, surround both of these species. So just to get your mind in the right place, um, the American pika lives in rocks, <laughs> such as in the Sierra Nevada, and the um, plateau pika lives on the Tibetan plateau. That's a meadow. The meadow itself is at 14,000 feet, and the mountains go up from there. So that's where I work um, when I'm up on the plateau. The overall, however, these are just two of about 30 species of pikas. The systematics is still being worked out. Um, 24 of the species live in China. Um, 28 together in Asia, and two species in North America, sort of sister species, the collared pika, found in British Columbia and Alaska, and the um, American pika that we have here in the Intermontane West. Now, both of our pikas live in rocks. Um, they're very similar. Um, in Asia, about half of the species are rock-dwelling pikas, have ecologies fairly similar to ours, and the other half live in open meadow steppe where they make burrows, and you'll see the contrast. Now, if you look at the middle plate, um, shameless plug for some of the books. Um, 
we just actually, in last year, came out with Lagomorphs, which has um, all the picos, rabbits, and hares of the world, and pictures of almost every species that have ever been photographed. Um, and you can come look at them afterwards. But if you see, morphologically, picas are pretty much similar in shape and size, um, but they live in these two contrasting habitats. Just to give you an idea of what some of the other species of picas look like, um, some of them are really fun. Um, this is Glover's pica. It's uh, found everywhere in the rocks up in the Tibetan Plateau. has never been studied. I keep telling the Chinese that. This is the collared pica. Um, this is the Turkestan red pica, um, Kozlov's pica. Um, and this is a forest dwelling pica that lives in Sichuan province. Um, here's a real flashy pica, the, the Chinese red pica, um, Okotonga. Um, Erythrotus, but probably the one that takes the cake is the is the is the teddy bear pika from the from the um, Tian Shan Mountains. So my colleague Li Weidong actually discovered and named this species, um, worked on it for ten years, then went back to his day job and went back ten years later, um, and the pikas were gone from fifty percent of the areas where he had found them. Um, he's he's kept working. Um, he's found signs of pikas. Um, this picture is the first living one that he had seen in 20 years. It ran across his boot, and he had a camera. Um, so that's a fairly famous picture. So I'll give you a, a little walk of where we're going. Um, we're going to talk first for the Plateau and American pikas about their, their longevity. We'll talk about their, their, their density, their reproductive status, their social behavior, their dispersal, their mating systems, and a little bit about their vocal repertoire. Now, because you're natural historians, you have to know where the data come from. Well, the data come from me sitting on rocks and, or the meadow. Um, but largely, I've had four long-term behavioral projects um, up in the Tibetan Plateau in Qinghai province beginning in 1984. Um, I always mark all my study areas um, in five meter grids. Um, I, know, I would like to know not just the behaviors that these animals engage in, but I want to know where they are so I can understand their relationship with all the other animals and the age and sex of all the other animals, as you'll see. And we live trap and mark all these animals, um, and we don't even begin to make observations until every single animal is marked. So we don't do statistics on population size, we just know everybody. Um, and the American Pike Guy have done long-term studies in the Sierra Nevada, including at Bodie and Old Ghost Town, which I'll talk about. A lot of the data I'll show you is from the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab and some from the Mono Craters. Um, and at RMBL, for example, we gridded four tailless slopes um, in five meter grids. Again, we don't even begin to study the animals until we have all the animals marked. Then we catch the animals, we weigh them, put on very distinctive colored ear tags, and then we sit. So our, our high-tech equipment is binoculars, a stopwatch, a pencil, and a clipboard, and patience. Um, where I work at the, um, at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab is out of um, Donald, Colorado, near Crested Butte. Um, my camp was right here. Um, my favorite pika and the first one I marked was Silverado, who lived there. Actually, this is Silverado's territory looking upslope. This is a slope that carried three pairs of pikas, um, relatively low density. And we'll come back to Silverado a little bit later. Um, we catch the animals in traps. Um, pikas don't have a lot of insight learning. They often look at all six, five sides of the trap before they find the open door. We um, lay, put them out with a little bit of anesthesia, weigh them, mark them, and then the tools of our trade. Um, the pikas generally don't mind that we're sitting on the rocks. Um, this is a rare, this was white silver. Um, he was an attack pika. Uh, <laughs> And there he is trying to chew up my clipboard. But um, most, of, most of the time, they just left us alone. So as I've told you and showed you the big habitat pictures, um, the plateau pika is an, anim is an animal that um, makes burrows in open meadow, um, whereas the American pika is a rock talus um, form, lives in rocks that basically is surrounded by vegetation. For their longevity, so, and you see that these animals are about the same body mass, uh, about the same shape, um, but they, the plateau pika um, is very short-lived. Um, most plateau pikas live only about one year, a little longer than a year. They're born one year, they, they live one year, but they don't live. Only a few live to be two years old into a second breeding season, 
Whereas the American pikas are remarkably long lived for a small animal that weighs about 170 grams. Um, some live to the age of six. A colleague of mine has had a marked colored ear tag pika that lived nine years. Um, and there are a lot of three and four year animals out there, year old animals out there. So the longevity is demonstrably different between uh, the plateau and the American pika. As is their population density. Um, the plateau pika can reach up to 300 animals per hectare, which is a fairly dense population. The density that, that builds um, because of their high rates of reproduction, which I'll tell you about, um, builds during the, re during the summer season. Um, during the really cold Tibetan winters, their population declines. Um, and they can also um, vary among years. Um, there's very little snow in the winter up in the Tibetan plateau. Most of the precipitation is the monsoonal rains that come through in the, in the summer. But when they do get snow, the pikas really can't make it, and, they, and there's heavy mortality. So there's lots of things that sort of knock this high number back, and then the big rates of reproduction bring them back on an annual basis. American pikas are very low density, a, a really solid, healthy population. There are 10 or 15 animals per hectare. Um, and the density tends not to vary over time. It tends to be relatively constant. Um, and animals that die tend to be replaced immediately by other animals that are satellite animals or juveniles that were born into the population. And we'll talk about that too. I've already hinted that the reproductive strategies in these animals tends to be very different. The plateau pika, the females are little baby machines. Every 21, once they start breeding in the summer, they turn out a litter every 21 days. The litters tend to be relatively large. They can have as many as eight offspring, generally about five. And, and they re so the fecundity rate of, in the plateau pika is extremely high over the course of a summer breeding season. American pikas initiate two litters, but they only successfully wean one. Um, if the first litter is successful, because they have an immediate postpartum estrus. Uh, the female is basically used, is using up all of her energy reserves to nurse the first litter. There's no fat reserves left to, to, to successfully bring off the second litter. And we don't know what happens, that they presumably just perish under the rocks. The litter size range is one to five. The most common litter size in American pikas is three. And the number that are commonly weaned because there's a lot of um, mortality during the course of, of, of of the nursing period, generally only, on average, most American pikas females have about two offspring per year versus maybe 20 that are turned out um, by plateau pikas. I, I'm gonna say one thing in passing here because I'm gonna come back to my study site at Bodhi. The litter size, the average litter size of pikas at Bodhi, an area that I'll talk about, is the, is the greatest of all the areas um, that we know of in North America for the species. Um, and you'll see the ramifications of that going forward. The spatial, the social organization, the spatial organization of these families is also extremely different. So you, you saw the big flat meadow that the, that the plateau pika lives on. Um, that is, it looks homogeneous to you, but to, a, but to plateau pikas, they live in um, family groups. Um, the, the diameter of a family territory is about 25 meters from one side to, to the other. Um, and the animals basically stay within those bounds. There can be multiple adult males and multiple adult females, or sometimes just one male and one female. We'll get back to talking about mating systems in a bit. But there are these disks of families that are found across the flat meadow um, with no real barriers between them. Um, the American pika is individually territorial. Males and females hold separate territories. The territories are on average the same size, um, but there is still structure that the um, males and females tend to alternate, and, they're, and you'll see how this works in just a little bit um, going across the, the tailor. So these territories tend to be relatively stable over time, and the territories tend to alternate, as I said, um, between males and females. Now, a lot of people who, carry, who, who get lots of data, like we do, sitting on the meadow and taking a, making a note every five minutes of the locality of every pika from their ear tags, um, people throw all the outliers out so their data look better. Ecologists cheat all the time by doing this. 
So I will say that in this particular slide, which shows six family groups, this is 100% of every single observation over a period of three months of adult females and their male and female offspring. Um, you can see that they're found in these little 25 meter circles and almost no spikes, which are rep would represent seeing an animal in a different five meter square grid in any of these family groups. Um, ah, but you say there's an exception there. This family lost the adult male. It was a monogamous family, so a lot of the juvenile males were slipping over there as they grew up so that they could maybe eventually claim that territory in the next year. So you can see how there's a very set social structure um, for these animals. Now I have to tell you that pikas, no, no lagomorphs hibernate. Pikas basically make hay piles that they, during the summer that they live off of during the winter. Shows the pika in a hay pile so that we can then talk about I hate to show you data slides, but that's what the way the world works. Um, you can measure the distance from each hay pile to the next closest hay pile. And you can know that this hay pile is occupied by a male and this hay pile is occupied by a female. So here's the distance between hay piles from a male to the next closest male and the next closest female. You see that basically the next closest female is much closer than the next closest male, which is probably two territories away. Similarly, females are closest to the, to the male and very far away from the, from the next closest female. If we look at every little five meter square grid and the times that any of these animals co-occur on any of these grids and we can overlay, this data set had one million lines of data when we did our sorts to do this kind of an analysis. And we could look at the overlaps that these animals have, and it's quite striking. Again, the males hardly overlap other males, but overlap other females. Females overlap, um, don't overlap um, other, over, they do overlap other males and don't overlap other females. And it doesn't matter what month it is, it actually becomes even more extreme when they sort of wind down toward the end of the summer. So these animals are really in a very sort of set relationship on the talus. So this little cartoon will show you how that works. If this is a male and that's a female, male, female, if this animal dies, male, female, these are two females, those two females will not behaviorally allow another female to claim that vacant territory. So if they're long-lived animals, which means territories become available very rarely but it's even more confining than that because animals that have to claim these territories have to fill the, be the gender of the animal that was in that territory previously to come down to this. So you can see that there's a lot going on that no one knew about pikas before we really analyzed these data in great detail. The social behavior is maybe one of the most fascinating things of these animals. Um, the plateau pika is they behave like monkeys. Sometimes during parts of the, of the summer, there's one social interaction between, uh, at least occurring every minute within a family territory. Um, there are more social behaviors initiated by adult males. Remember, the mothers are little baby machines and the dads are real dads. Um, and so there's all this common expression of social behaviors among juveniles. American pikas, I hate, they're, they're cute but they're really boring to watch because you can sit there and, and you can watch them and record every, every minute what their behavior is for 10 hours and maybe if you're lucky see one social interaction which might be a chase um, between a couple males or something like that. Um, you don't see many social interactions among pikas in, in an American pika colony. Um, and it's generally aggressive. So we, we had to come up with sort of a an affiliative behavior category, which now I, I think might be the worst behavior category in the literature, um, but it works, and just, as you will see. Th this is two pikas sitting within three meters of one another and not chasing each other. <laughs> and we call that social tolerance. Um, and you'll see how that plays out going forward. So let's see about um, examples of the social behavior. Here are some examples. Um, these pikas box, they sit in contact, they feed 
with one another. Um, males will basically um, hear a little peep from, we'll talk about vocalization across the meadow and then the dad will run over and, and the young from two different litters will basically follow the dad all through the little territory like this. Um, it's quite extraordinary and we see that most of these behaviors are by, are by males. Um, before the reproductive season, there's still social behaviors between the males and females, but once the first litter's up, the rate of behavior goes up considerably. And again, the dark bars are males, and the adult male is always expressing more social behaviors than are the females, because again, they're little baby machines. And the rate of behaviors goes up amazingly once the second litter's up. Um, the first litter and the second litter are interacting and the adults are interacting and it's all happening on this little 25 meter disc that would be that family, um, made that family territory. Um, sorry that some of these numbers are a little bit dark because these are males and females. Um, we looked at affiliative and aggressive behavior of social behaviors that occurred within families. And the, the big numbers, which are three digits and four digits here, um, depending on whether you're dealing with adult males, females, or juveniles, are much more than the aggressive behaviors. And females also, almost all of their base behaviors within a family group are all affiliative. They're doing these social things, they're grooming each other, um, and hardly any chases at all. Most of the aggression occurs between males, which is why in that one graph of spikes, I couldn't include adult males, because they're running all over the place, because Males, I hate to tell you, are still trying to mate with every female out there. Um, so there are these fast chases that go all around the whole territory. And about 96% of all of the aggression we see is between males from different families and their long chases and, and sometimes vigorous fights that they have. Um, I told you that I would come back to social tolerance. This is how we can record this in the American pica. There are Social tolerance is hardly ever expressed between males or between females. They're almost always between a male and a female. Doesn't matter what month. And the solid part of these bars are nearest neighbors. So you get the idea that these animals are maybe individually territorial, which is what everybody knew, but there's actually a lot more structure and, and recognition of an individual mating pair. Um, Pika's duet, we'll talk about vocalizations, calling back and forth to each other. Almost all of those are nearest neighbors. Um, opposite sex pairs. Um, you don't see many copulations, but everyone that we that we observed in our long-term study was, was between nearest neighbors. Now the pikas are very vocal. You've got, got this already. Um, plateau pikas have six different vocalizations. Um, I can't mimic them. <laughs> um, there are whines and trills, um, long calls, short calls, um, and the like. Um, a, a really soft, repetitive alarm call um, my wife who's sitting in the back is actually the vocal expert and accompanied me the first year and helped work all of these out when nothing was known about the vocalizations in plateau pikas. Um, but the young from the, from the different age litters are communicating and communicating with their father and this is going on all the time. The males give a long, a long call, which is like a song. It, it lasts about 25 or 30 seconds um, and that's a mating call, which is a little bit different. And then we also have the repetitive alarm calls. Sometimes you don't hear the alarm calls. Um, if, if a family has, lives within a 25 meter disc, um, any animal that sees an approaching predator that wants to warn their immediate kin doesn't have to make a very loud call. So often it's windy up in the plateau and we actually see the pikas there. Really soft calls. Um, but because they only have to warn animals that they're immediately genetically related with that are really in short distance away. The American pika has only two basic vocalizations. One is the, is the long call. Again, um, in the Sierra Nevada, it starts eh, 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 and then it goes to a double note eh, 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 and then always finishes with a flourish eh, eh, eh. Um, and it's, a, it's about 25 seconds long. Um, it's given largely during the mating season, given um, only by, by males. There's a, so, there's a short call that announces territory ownership. Um, during the haying season, a pika will give a call to say, okay, this is my territory. And then they'll run out in the meadow and they'll fill their mouth full of hay and they'll bring it back to their hay pile. 
and then they'll go up and rock and call you and say, I'm back, it's my territory. Um, if due to a weasel or um, a sleet storm, that animal dies, the absence of a call from that territory will cause a shuffling um, of maybe animals that are, don't have territories living in interstices between territories that would normally never make it through the winter. These sites are claimed sometimes within just hours um, by the absence of the calling. Um, when the short call is given in a repetitive way, um, then that's the alarm call. And this is what people often hear because if pikas will alarm when humans come onto a slope. If an eagle flies overhead or if a pine marten runs across the slope, you hear them give these long, and it's just the short call over and over and over again, sometimes a very long period of time. If it's a weasel and the pika sees the weasel, they don't give the alarm call right away. Because what can a weasel do? Weasels are only this big around. They can get in the rocks. The call actually brings attention to the caller. So they actually wait five or 10 minutes after they apprehend the weasel and then they give the chance for the weasel to clear out of their territory and then they'll give the alarm call that will warn the other animals in the colony. Really great stuff. Um, the one thing that's similar between plateau pikas and, and, and American pikas is that they're poor dispersers. Um, uh, oops. About 58, say 60% say of all the juveniles that we mark in one year are still living in the same family territory the next year. Um, there's a male bias. Males are more likely to disperse than females. But when one, when one of these animals disperses, it's ours often just to the, to the family territory next door. Um, we had only, we had one male move five home ranges away, five territories away, um, out of a four hectare study area, the huge study area that we had. So these animals are relatively telepathic. American pikas are also really poor dispersers. Um, if you get down to the numbers, um, a very high percentage, 11 out of 13 animals that we, that we marked in one year and that were alive and breeding the next year, either lived on a territory that was occupied by their mother who died or their putative father that died or next door. In other words, they were essentially telepathic. During the season that they're born, if a juvenile actually tries to find a, 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 a vacancy in the talus, they'll go up and um, they'll just get mercilessly chased back um, from the territory holders um, that are up there. And often, even behaviorally, the juveniles tend to be active at times of the day that the, ju that the adults are not in active because they're, they're likely to be chased. Um, so they're not very good dispersers, and this will come into play a little bit later as well. The mating system is fascinating. Um, the plateau pika, some families, some territories are, mon have, are monogamous, have one male and one female. Some are, have phylogeny, which is one male and multiple females. Some are polyandrous and have basically multiple males and, and, and one female. Or sometimes we have complex things, which is much as the two males and three females on a family group. And it just, it's because the winters are harsh. The populations are high at the beginning of winter, the winters are harsh, and it's just a random chance who lives and who dies. In our large study area, we would sometimes have sort of a male bias at one end of the study area, and those would be largely polyandrous territories. If we had a female bias at the other edge, they would be largely polygynous territories. Um, and it was all just the random chance of who happened to live and who happened to die over the winter. Um, the American pika is really, facu I, I would call them facultatively monogamous. I've given you behavioral data to show that these animals live in pair, closely related pairs because they have to mate when the snow still covers the ground in teleological anticipation that they've timed it right that the female will give birth when the snow is melted and the flush of vegetation is up. If they, if they time it too early, they may lose their first litter because they don't have enough energy to, to, to make milk for the young. If they time it too late, a female that is successful before them will have young that are bigger than their young that get the rare territories that are available because they're so long lived. Now males can't defend multiple females. 
the territories are largely male, female, male, female along the, the Talus Meadow interface. It's very uneconomical. No male can, can control a territory that's like that. So that we call them sort of facultatively monogamous. A male will still try to run across the Talus and try to sneak a copulation with another female, but this is very rare. So to sort of wrap up the first half of my talk, um, talk about polyandry. You can take a little rest like that pika does. Um, we, we, have, we know our animals because we watch each one of these families really closely. We had one that had, um, actually it had two males and two females. And the, fe one, the females weren't synchronous and so one female came into estrus. And I watched for a period of three or four hours, two males sitting side by side and then and the eating, nose rubbing each other, and then each mating with the female, and then going back and being friendly with each other, no aggression between the males, and just taking turns <laughs> for like three hours mating with this one female. True polyandry. If these were ground squirrels, they would just beat the crap out of each other. Um, but pikas don't do that. Um, and so it was really very much um, observing polyandry in mammals that might be one of the best examples of polyandry in, in any mammal, which is a really, really rare mating system um, in mammals. I have a Silverado story. I told you, I showed you Silverado's territory. Um, he was my favorite pika, the very first pika we marked when we started our study. Um, I'd be eating my granola in the morning and watch Silverado because it was the closest territory to our little table. Um, we went down to get a shower once a week, believe it or not, and, um, and to get groceries and get our mail. And one of my assistants was watching Home Slope with the three putative pairs of pikas. But uh, actually, two of the males had died over winter. So we went a couple miles away and trapped a male pika and introduced him to the slope. Silverado was there, um, and so was Fitzroy. Um, and so. We hardly ever saw Fitzroy. You would think that a territory defense would be that you would defend your territory, but Silverado was defending all three male territories. Maybe in anticipation that if he had any male offspring, that they then would leave, he would leave his genes preferentially because they would be able to claim those territories when they got to be big enough. We hardly ever saw Fitzroy. So my assistant sitting at the top of the, of the, of the third pair, and she sees three blurs coming. And the first blur, well, the first blur was Fitzroy being chased by the second blur, which was Silverado, being chased by the third blur, which was a weasel. And so Silverado chased Fitzroy off of the tailus where they can basically hide. And the, the weasel nailed and killed Silverado, my favorite animal. All the pikas in the slope gave alarm calls. Fitzroy went and sat on a tall, prominent rock and smugly just looked around. He wasn't related to any animals on that slope. Why would he give an alarm call? And within 20 minutes, he had gone down and taken over Silverado's territory. Bluebell, his mate, Silverado's ex-mate. Um, and if they didn't have different uh, ear color tags, you couldn't tell his behavior any different from that of Silverado. Um, he was waiting for his chance and he took it. So this gives you some insight, at least, into the ecology of these two species, um, both the plateau pika and the, and the American pika. So with this as your background, I'd like to tell you a couple conservation stories, because there are really, really pressing conservation stories that deal with each one of these species. So the plateau pika, the pikas occupy the prairie dog niche on the Tibetan plateau. And like we have done, which I'll show you later, the Chinese authorities have poisoned this animal relentlessly for the last five decades. They consider it a pest. They say it has high density, it causes rangeland degradation, increases erosion, eats forage that could, yaks could eat. Um, they're just the skirts. This is a native species. And they have all these thoughts about it. Um, so they, they control this animal. So here's, you can still Google environment fund targets rats. It still comes up from 2006. And just to give you some idea what happens in China is that we have rat infestations 
I point that word, has been severely threatening the ecological environment, tackled with a special 7.5 billion yuan, at that time translated to $925 million. If you were the superintendent, and this is all in the Sanjiang Yuan National Nature Reserve, if you were the superintendent of Yosemite National Park, you wouldn't mind a budget of $925 million unless it meant killing one of your native species. Um, this is just phenomenal. Um, it's, they use botulin type C poisons. Um, botulin C poison in, a, in its pure form is the single most poisonous substance on the face of the earth. You can buy it in bottles on the streets, mix it with grain, and then they, 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 they enlist um, convicts and, or forced Tibetan pastoralists to, to walk, go across the meadow and feed burrows um, to kill all the pipers. Now, you say that the Chinese are horrible. Well, this is, this is a U.S. Forest Service press release. <laughs> the U.S. Forest Press release is saying that they're going to have a goal of increasing black-tailed prairie dog populations. The article actually goes on to say, oh, these, piece, these species are keystone species. Less than 1% is currently infested. Infested. So we're using the same word for our native species. And the agency would like to see the animals occupy up to 2% of the federal grasslands. This is like admitting a 98% error rate. <laughs> Wiping off a, a native species that's a keystone species in our ecosystem. So. Um, I don't know what it is about some of these small mammals that attracts um, this kind of vitriol. But my take is completely different, as you might imagine. Um, in the Plateau Pica, um, you have to look at the big picture. The picture includes Tibetan pastoralists, their yaks, and the Plateau Pikas. So my role is to figure out what's going on with the Plateau Pikas. And I cast the Plateau Pikas as a keystone species for biodiversity. Keystone species is one that if you remove it from, just like a keystone, which is where the name comes from, if you don't have the keystone, the arch falls apart. And if you remove the plateau pica, it completely bankrupts many elements of the natural pro processes that are going on in the ecosystem. Um, the plateau picas oops, provide habitat for endemic species of birds, source of food for most of the predators, um, increase plant species richness, and um, increase ecosystem functioning, as we will see. So pikas provide habitat for the endemic species. They make burrows. Um, there are no trees. There were no trees in the picture I showed you. <laughs> if you're a native species, you nest in burrows. If you poison the pikas, what happens to the burrows? The burrows collapse, and the breeding habitat for these endemic species is gone, and they disappear. Um, th this is um, Hume's ground pecker. Um, these are different snow finches. We've done controlled studies. Um, these species here are all snow finches, all found much more likely to be found um, in standardized block censuses and non-poisoned areas with pikas versus poisoned areas. Um, Pseudopodosis humos, this is the ground tit. Um, we had 2,400 observations on pika areas and not one um, in standardized walks on poisoned areas. And a good control you all probably all know what a horned lark is. This is the horned lark. They nest on the surface and aren't, um, aren't obligatory um, nesters inside the burrows, and, and they're not affected in areas that are poisoned. Um, so that's sort of like a good control. Here we have um, black kites and upland buzzard. These are significantly different, and you'll see what's going on. Pika serve as the primary food for nearly all the um, Plateau's predators. I put a little asterisk by snow leopards because snow leopards just love to eat blue sheep. But a snow leopard will still eat pikas if it's basically there. Um, and so all of these animals, whether you're talking about black kites, upland buzzards, um, weasels, palaces cat, um, a Tibetan fox, they're really funny looking fox, aren't they? 95 to 99% of their diet is plateau pikas. If you kill the pikas, these animals disappear. And what we call a grizzly bear, a big brown bear, um, their diet is almost exclusively pikas. Um, Kozlov, a, a Russian biologist back in the late 18, I guess it was 1890, shot one and cut open a, a, a bear's stomach and it had 53 pikas in it. Um, pikas are sort of quick and they run around the bears, but the bears don't give up. Um, when 
when you poison the pikas, the bears have to find an alternative source of food so that the local Tibetans that are living in their black tents have to put up solar arrays and put up electric fences around their tents because the, because the bears are now breaking into all their tents. So all, all this poisoning is really incredibly um, counterproductive. Um, one of my graduate students, Baden Chuyin, we call him Paulden, has done a, did a control study, again like with the birds, of non-poison or poison sites. The blue sites are with, with pikas. Um, and you can see that the, the, the number, the counts we get of carnivores on, on standardized walks is much greater. Um, except for sort of animals like the raven, which are real generalist. Um, but the other species tend to be much more likely to be found where there are um, pikas than areas that have been poisoned. Pikas also greatly improve the plant species richness. And some of the species that you know well, such as fireweed and edelweiss, um, and a couple of really unusual flowers that grow up in the plateau, which is really beautiful. The Tibetan princess flower is the common name of this poppy. Um, and, and here from one of my other graduate students, um, Brigitte Hogan, um, all the on-color lines are up here. These are cumulative species, um, number of species by individuals and doing, she just crawled around on the meadow um, on her knees with plant quadrats. And there are many more species of plants that are found on pica areas than are found on areas where pikas have been poisoned. Um, where you poison pikas, you also completely upset the nutrient cycling because the pikas dig their burrows and recycle the dirt. Um, and also there's the, the aspect of hydrology. Um, the presence of pico burrows um, reduces water erosion because it helps the ground act like a sponge when the, hot, when the heavy monsoon rains come during the summer. And we have also tested that. Max Wilson, who lives just up the road now in Cottonwood, um, did a study in three major drainages, the Yellow River, the Huangha, the Yangtze, and the Mekong. And we, we did, this is a, an infiltrometer that you can buy from Turf Tech International in Florida that looks at the rate that water actually seeps into the ground. And, and the rate of water is much higher on a, um, right next to a pica burrow with um, about a meter away from a pica burrow and on areas that have been poisoned, the infiltration rate is really, really low. Well, anyone who's ever had a leak in the plumbing in your house, all water has to go somewhere. And when the monsoon rains come, in areas where they poison the pikas, the livestock have basically, the, the burrows have gone away, the livestock have basically tamped down the soil, that water will run off and cause downstream flooding and loss of life in China's rivers. Um, and so this, the people that say that pikas are, are a problem because they increase erosion, that's the exact opposite. And so this is one of the main less lessons we're taking to policymakers to, to stop the poisoning up on the plateau. So we really are working with local people. Um, pikas are really part of the solution to whatever rangeland degradation issues there are in the plateau. They're not part of the problem. I'd like to tell you, we're, um, it's hard to get data out of China for what they're really accomplishing, but we have begun to see um, news reports. I got one um, just about a month ago saying, we owe the pika an apology. <laughs> <It really meant. laughs> um, this was on a, a newspaper broad, um, and, and eventually a C CCTV broadcast in China. So we're turning the corner to stop this poisoning, which is really one of the largest poison efforts of a native species that there is. Um, and so we feel that we've been actually making a lot of progress. With the American pika, um, there's also the story that, um, well, Barack Obama sort of said it himself, commemorating the um, 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. Alpine mammals like pikas are being forced further upslope to escape higher temperatures because of climate change. The problem, and we can't blame him because his minders told him to say that. There is not one piece of data that supports that contention. Not one, not in the published literature. Pikas are really poor dispersers. They're already as high up the mountain as they can get. And um, there are no pika populations that are going further up simply because the climates have become warmer. But many people still think, and the press that you read, when I go to, and, uh, I'll make up, I go to cocktail parties. I really don't go to many cocktail parties. But people who come up to you, to say, oh, you work on pikas, they're so endangered, it's so horrible. And I have to say, well, that's really not the case. And I will tell you what's really going on. 
There have been several sort of, I call them lawsuits, but they're petitions to um, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. California is the only state that has an Endangered Species Act, which applies there. And the, in our Endangered Species Act at the federal level, all these decisions have taken the stand that the American pike is not endangered, and I consider these to be the correct decisions. But there's still this compelling scenario with pikas that they should be endangered. And I've helped contribute to this because it's largely with my data. Um, pikas are alpine animals. They're extremely, extremely sensitive to warm temperatures with the advent of global climate change. I guess you could say that it, it just sounds good that they would be pushed off the type of mountain. Um, and I'm responsible for some of this. Um, pikas have a really high resting body temperature, so they have very little clearance when they overheat um, or else they could potentially die. Um, they live at low density, which demographically means that they're really at risk of, more at risk of, of, of extinction. They're poor dispersers. Um, they have a low reproductive capacity. Um, there's even the case um, that is made by a lot of people that there's, um, with global warming, we have less snowpack, and the insulative layer of snow is missing, um, and the pikas are likely to freeze during the winter. Um, the one thing about their natural history that really keeps them going, maybe, is that they're so long live they can sort of outlive some of this stuff. But let's see what's really happening. Um, I said I'd come back to a study site at Bodie. How many people have ever been to Bodie? It's a wonderful ghost town. Um, Bodie is about 30 kilometers from the crest of the Sierra Nevada, and these are ore dumps. Um, and the pikas have colonized the ore dumps from sort of natural lava rock outcrops um, where they had lived um, since the Pleistocene. And you can see that at Bodhi pikas, it, they have at one time or another occupied every single ore dump at Bodhi. Um, and they leave wonderful characteristic hay piles. Um, sometimes they, they sort of don't get it right and make their hay pile in an old mining artifact. Um, but the pikas have been everywhere, and it, it's because they have these, these great, they're, they're lagomorphs. They're related to rabbits. They have round feces, so you, you can't mistake their feces from a, a chipmunk or a ground squirrel. You can contemplate how, how high their little butts have to be off the ground to make these cones um, while they talk on. Anyway, um, one of the things that people say is that with global warming, all those beautiful alpine plants are going to disappear and the food resource for the pikas will be gone, and that's one of the reasons they would go extinct. But pikas are at Bodhi. They're eating sagebrush, bitterbrush, and rabbit brush. It's not called nasiosa for a species name for nothing. Um, this is really gr grotty stuff. Um, pikas are generalized herbivores, and wherever they are, they'll choose the plant that has the highest protein, the highest water content, um, and they don't have to eat beautiful alpine vegetation. So this argument falls, certainly falls short. Um, from some of my work um, early on when I was a graduate student, um, I did temperature studies at Bodhi. Um, during the summer, pikas are not seen active from about 10 o'clock in the morning to about 4 o'clock in the afternoon when the temperatures are really high. These are black bulb and shade temperatures. Um, at the exact same place, in May, when the temperatures are much cooler, the pikas are active all day. And during the summer, you can go up to high altitude where it's much cooler and the pikas are active all day. They're very facultative. If it's hot, they're smart. They go and live in the interstices of the rocks where they can dump heat and where it's generally much, much cooler. Bodhi's also a really interesting place because of all those islands. Every little patch, every little ore dump has a potential of holding a pika population or having a, an extinction because of some demographic process because the, the patches are relatively small. And in fact, at no one time are all the patches occupied. So what we have done, and I've started work there in 69. My first full census was in 72. And then a, a biologist named Mike Gilpin, his California license plate used to say Metapop, um, contacted me and say, so we've got to go back and, and work on this some more. So in 89, we began s annual censuses. We have a couple two-year gaps from 89 to 2010. So we studied these populations from 69 to 2010. Longest study of any pika population. 
and one of the hottest places that pikas have ever been recorded. And um, over this period, we had like 109 recolonization events of patches that were vacant, and 114 populations that went extinct on patches, almost an equal number. Um, but they were just willy-nilly um, over time. In any given year, sometimes there were more extinctions and sometimes there were more recolonizations. But we have temperature data, actually because it's a mining town. We actually have daily temperature data at Bodie going back to the 1800s. But we have daily temperature data for, for this particular population. And you can, make the, you can make a hypothesis. You can say, well, maybe in years that are warmer, you would have more, ex there'd be the years with more extinctions. And maybe the years that were cooler would have more colonizations. We've done every possible correlation between temperatures and, and the counts, the frequency counts of extinctions and colonizations, and there is no signal whatsoever, not one significant statistical test. There's no climate signal at all that explains this data set. Um, so it doesn't appear that climate is basically causing what's going on there. But one of the things that has happened at Bodhi is that the southern half of the population has gone extinct. It started at 89, by 91 it was pretty far gone. By actually 1996 was the last time we saw any pika in the southern constellation of Orion Belt. Meanwhile, the northern constellation has an average occupancy of 70%. And in the first year, the first census, 83.3% were occupied. In 2009, 83.8%, they're almost the same. So this is a nice little metapopulation of extinctions and recolonizations up here. But since 2006, none of the animals that live up here have, this is like, that's a kilometer. That's about three kilometers from top to bottom. These populations are really close, like only a kilometer away. They're really poor dispersers. So these pikas have not recolonized this area. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. Then you have this aspect of climate modeling. A lot of people like to look at the long-term projections of climate change. Now, I'd like to tell you that I think that climate change is one of the most existential threats to human society that we've ever had. We've never seen anything like this. And, and the people who do this work are fantastic. And they do tell us that about six degrees Celsius is about the temperature change that we would expect by the end of the century. But right now, Bodhi, is on average 8.3 degrees Celsius warmer than pikas that are living in the nearby Sierra Nevada. If you want to know how pikas are going to respond to climate change, you can just look at what they're doing at Bodhi right now. They're just not active in the middle of the day. They're a bit active at night. So we've moved to other places. Um, 2010 sort of got tired of the bureaucracy of the state park at Bodhi. And we went to the Mono Craters, and we've done all the same behavioral work that we did in the Rocky Mountains here. Um, the Mono Craters are, it's, it's like watching pikas on the moon. I love pikas. Um, I understand pikas. They should not be here. But they're there. And they've been there since the Pleistocene. Th this caldera blew up in 60,000 years ago. Probably took a while to cool off, and then had to be colonized from the Sierra Crest. Um, and there is almost no vegetation for these animals to eat, but there are pikas running all over the mono craters. Um, and yes, the temperatures here, this is a south-facing slope, reached 50 degrees Celsius. And these pikas are still living there. So it doesn't look like climate change is doing good. Then the other thing, and I'm responsible for this. In 1978, I published a paper that said, when there's low snowpack, we're going to lose the thermal insulation of the snow, and pikas will have suffer a great uh, amount of density-independent mortality. But we can test this because in the winter of 2014 to 2015 in the Sierra Nevada, there was almost no snow. The average of the, of the water content of the snow on the 1st of April, which is the standard water uh, snow measurement, was 5% of average. In, in the more than 100 years that these data have been taken, the second place is 25% of average. This is just the outside, this is the outlier. Governor Jerry Brown stood on a place on April 1st that had never not had snow 
and there was no snow in sight. So, all the pika should have died. Well, Connie Millar and I had independently found 37 beautiful hay piles in our various work in 2014, and we went back and checked these out in 2015, and we found 36 pikas. They didn't die. The pikas proved me wrong. Um, but people still are touting this as being one of the reasons why pikas are going extinct. And then pikas are active at night. Um, you should have Ken, have you ever had Ken Hickman come give a talk? He's, he builds his own cameras, um, traps, which are fantastic. He's been putting cameras in front of pikas and found that their nocturnal activity is 30 to 39% of the time. This picture was taken at 10, 15 p.m. Pika's just running around on his hay pile. So they're not just active during the day. And that's even true of pikas that are found at high altitude. So we don't have to, w people say, well, the warm temperatures are gonna mean that they're, they're less and less active in the middle of the day and they'll have no, uh, not enough time to gather their food. Well, they don't have to gather it during the day because they can gather it at night. So that puts a, a bullet through that hypothesis. And then the last thing is that the, the hype about Great Basin pikas is that 25% um, of historic sites in the Great Basin have been documented to go extinct within the last few years. And this has been the driver for most of the news reports that you've ever read about pika extinction. So with Connie Millar and um, biologists from Nevada Fish and Wildlife and Utah Fish and Wildlife, we have published a paper which has documented 2,387 records of extant pika sites that were surveyed sometime from 2005 to the present. We had 89 records of documented extirpated sites and 774 sites where we found old pika sign, um, but no pikas. And this is what that looks like. You can recognize Mono Lake in the background. This site, yep, Connie took me there. Um, you can see that pikas have been peeing on the rocks. This is pika poop here. Um, it's a huge tailless patch under this rock, and there are no pikas there. So this is an example of one of the extinctions. Pikas are going extinct on some of these patches. From where I took those pictures, if you turned 180 degrees, you would look at the Sweetwater Mountains, which is an isolated mountain range. And in the Sweetwaters, there are small patches of tailless like this. And here, fresh pika sign, fresh pika hay piles, and they've been there since the Pleistocene without going extinct. Um, so we've taken these thousands of observations in the Great Basin, and you can take all the climate data that you can, and then you can plot for each site how, what, what sort of the climate envelope is for that species, and whether it's an extant site, an extinct site, or an old site. And all the, the extant sites, all the um, extirpated and old signs are found within the geographic and climatic space of, of, of extant sites. You can't, the, there's a slight tendency that the extirpated and old sign sites are warmer or drier, but they're, but they're found on the same sort of cloud. So the, there's considerable overlap of extirpated old and extant sites with the same climate space. So non-climatic factors have to be responsible for some of these population losses. Um, and it doesn't seem that climate basically is one of the main drivers of extinction in, even in the Great Basin. So what I've told you, if you kept track, um, pikas are more resilient than we thought. Populations are found in more and more hot sites. Pikas can adjust their activity to ambient temperatures, including being nocturnal. They can adjust their diet to whatever's there, including at Mono craters where there's there. Fecundity, so fecundity is really a measure of physiological fitness of females. Bodhi, the hottest site that's ever been studied um, in detail, has the highest litter size, highest average litter, litter size. There are litters of five of American pikas at Bodhi. So females can't be that stressed by the environment which is found there. They can survive winters at a high altitude without an insulated blanket of snow. But the big caveat is, remember the southern patch, the southern constellation at Bodhi. Patch size and distance to other occupied patches is important to understand what's going on with pikas. Pika populations that become extinct on these isolated patches 
in today's world are not gonna get recolonized. So the population trajectory of pikas is indeed down. Whenever think some one of these isolated patches goes extinct, it's very, very unlikely to be recolonized. But we don't see any of the major trends for mass ex reasons for cause of mass extirpation or extinction of the species um, for all the other reasons that I mentioned. So I hope that you now think pikas are fascinating. Um, We've got much to learn about their adaptability um, as an indicator species maybe for global warming and certainly with the plateau pika, an agent providing important ecological services. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know um, that particular fire. Um, Joanna Varner was studying a population of pikas that was overrun by a, by a forest fire, and none of her animals died. They were all marked, and she went back with great trepidation because she was a doctoral <laughs> student and she needed the data, and um, she has a published paper on the extent of a forest fire that just overran her talus, um, and th nobody died. Um, they're just proving to be remarkably adaptive. <laughs> um, that, that's what I can say. Yeah, question? No, and, and, and that's sort of a, 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 there's a paper published on that. Connie and I were gonna publish a paper on it, but we got scooped. Um, and and it's, a, it's a really dicey question, because for, first of all, um, there probably are, over millennia, become physiological differences between high and low altitude pikas to a certain extent. So that means that if you were, and most of the extirpations are at low sites. Um, so that means that you would want to take pikas from low sites and move them. But all the low sites don't have the surplus animals um, to be able to move. So I think it's really an untractable proposition at the, at the present time. Um, and, and what's interesting, even if, it, even if they were made in endangered species, I don't know what you would do, because almost all the pika populations are already living in protected areas and um, drive every car in California into the ocean or something like that. But um, I don't think the climate change is really one of, the, one of the, the things that's really driving this system. I think that these, I think that most of the patches, and the person that published the paper on the seven extinctions in the Great Basin refuses He's published like the same data, like on eight or nine papers. He's never given the size of the patches. And from what we can tell from Google Earth is that they're all really small. And all these small patches, just like we fi find at Lodi, have this certain stochastic probability of going extinct. Um, and that yes, they probably won't be recolonized. Um, but I don't think that, um, I don't think that the absolute temperature may not be the factor that's driving the extinction, but it's going to, it's, but it's going to drive the inability of the pikas to recover from whatever extinctions take place. I think the pikas will still be here when we're gone, personally. Yeah. Oh, um, it's called focal animal sampling. You basically, um, the, all the we have a whole series of colors. So red, blue, green, silver. So every every pika is recognized individually. I can sometimes you can't see the other side, and I have a thing that all the bright colors, red, yellow, and orange, are are the right ear of males, and blue, white, and silver are in the, uh, and the right ear of females. So you can sort of you sometimes even tell gender if you only see the right side. But when you do focal animal sampling, we, st we study them for 15 and 15 minute blocks. And you basically randomly choose an animal and you study that animal specifically for 15 minutes and then you switch animals and switch animals and switch animals. Um, but 
but what we can, what we do in, with the American pica, because they're low density, um, we also record, uh, we can, and, and you, we can only see about 40 meters on a side it, with, with great accuracy. But we can also record the five meter cell that any other insurgents that come in from the outside are at. And so all that gets coded, which is why the data set gets blown up to a million lines. In China, what we do is that we do a scan sample of our 40 meters, and, and because we have all those millions of animals, um, and we don't have enough color combinations to take care of all the babies, and so we have, <laughs> and, 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 and so all, all, all the animals in one litter that come up on the same day will all get little blues or little greens or something like that, so we can at least tag them to, to, to there. And we do a scan sample and record every single thing in the, in the, in the five meter squares that they're in. And then we begin our, our focal animal sampling. And then every five minutes, we'll do a complete scan of everybody. And that's, and, and you, get, you get really good at it. You, you just can't have colorblind assistants. <laughs> <laughs> you had a question also. Um, I really pride myself on my publication per dollar ratio. Um, <laughs> The work at Bodie has essentially not been funded by anybody. I, I've, um, I've had small grants um, to sort of do things, but to do all the censuses, I just buy a six pack of beer for each one of my graduate students and we drive up there and we, and we spend a couple of days doing it. They love doing it. Um, for the work that we finished off in China, I've, I've had NSF grants to work in China because that's much more expensive and the Chinese gouge us all no matter how we do it. So. We recently had a million dollar grant from in the CNH program, Coupled Natural and Human Dynamics, which was largely dealing with all the grazing ecosystems. So we weren't just doing the pikas, we were doing all the pastoralists and all their behavior and, uh, of, of how the, their rest rotation was working with all their yaks. And a lot of our papers are dealing with that because it's really part of the issue um, and stuff. Um, so we've, we've been successful when we've had to be successful. I'll be happy to talk to anybody else after this. And you can come and take a look.